Good evening. Um, sorry about that. That was fairly typical. I, I seem to have become the Bermuda Triangle of hardware in the last three days. Uh, this is my third laptop I've installed this uh, presentation on. So I'm hoping everything's going to work. I've spent the last two days doing nothing else. I needed to make like one slide change. And uh, here I am, nearly 24 hours later. But uh, we'll see. So um, first of all, introduction, who am I? Uh, my name is Major Malfunction. Uh, I'm a goon here at DEF CON. I'm also the um, London representative or, or point of contact for DC 4420. And uh, I'm a security professional by day. Um, in fact, I, I live in a very carefully constructed fantasy world where I have like a, an underground bunker and I do, you know, secret stuff. And I go by the name of Adam Laurie. That's my cover name when I need to go undercover. So, so uh, why did I look at Mag Stripe? Um, some of you may have caught my talk last time on infrared. And you'll know I'm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you'll know I'm kind of into old school technologies, looking at things that have been around for a long time, and people start to just sort of forget about, move on to the next thing. But there's there's a big deployed base of of mag stripe. And uh, when I started looking at it, you know, I mean, I'd done the infrared. I'd, I'd spent all those nights in hotels in the wrong time zone with nothing to do, wide awake and uh, exhausted the possibilities with the, the IR. So I kind of thought, well, what else can I look at? And, uh, ooh, room key, hmm. <laughs> so I started looking at that stuff, and uh, yeah, I just found it's the same old story again, security by obscurity. Thoroughly, thoroughly insecure, um, and yet people still rely on it for, for reasonably high security applications. Um, I look at it, again, like the infrared, because it's there, I had nothing to do, and um, because I have no life. I'm a sad geek that just likes to play with things and break them. Oh. Actually, before we get started, <laughs> speaking of having no life, I did a conference recently and they had these really cool t-shirts. Um, and I thought it was a really good way. It's such an old school thing. This was like, this is a turning point in my life when this game came out. In fact, this was when you could say I started to have no life. Because <laughs> I would come home from work and I would go straight to the pub and like all my money went into this machine and I would spend all night playing it. And it was the first really proper um, game. Uh, you'll probably all know it as, it's called Space Invaders. And I just thought it was a really good test, this t-shirt, of how old school the audience is. So I'm going to ask you a question about this t-shirt and just try and gauge just how old school you guys are. So from an old school perspective, um, and there's a t-shirt, by the way, um, for whoever gets this right. 4420 shirt. Um, what was wrong with this picture? Okay, um, yeah, the answer was four houses from this gentleman here, but uh, so wrong number of houses. It's not a technical detail like that. It's, it's um, something more fundamental. So it's not a detail thing. It's like... Yeah, some interesting answers. Okay, colors. Actually, some of the... Yeah, it was all mono on the originals, but actually some of the machines had um, sort of plastic colored strips on them. So, <laughs> This is, we're talking seriously old school here. You know, this is monogram, uh, monogram, monochrome. Sorry. Hang on a sec. Hand, hands up, and I'll call you out. Go. There's too many enemies. Too many enemies. Um, yeah, like I said, it's not a detail thing. There's lots of detail coming. Out. Extra letters. No, no. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I didn't design the shirt and it's not my product that it's pushing, so. Yes, sir. It has a vendor's name on it. Uh, yeah, that's, 
That's one thing wrong with it. It's got a vendor's name on it. Yes, sir. Has huge holes. Well, actually, you're, you're getting close. Um, okay, I'm going to give you a clue. The holes have, have something to do with it. The holes in the building have something to do with it. Should the shots be taken out from the bottom? The man's got it. Okay, so, well, there's a, there's a thing missing. Well, there's an enemy missing. There's a spacecraft, okay? Yeah, the flying saucer flies across the top. And the way you score the flying saucer is it either got like 50 points, 75 points, 150 points, or top score is 300 points. Now you see this guy's got like one bullet in the air at the moment. You can only have one bullet in the air. If you fire, you have to wait for that bullet to get somewhere before you can fire the next one. So the way you got the high score on the ship was they had a random number sequence. And the random number sequence was based on how many shots you had fired. So you would shoot a certain number of shots and it would get up to 300 points. And then they would shoot another sequence. So it was like 15 and then 7. I forget what the exact number is. So you do 24 shots and then 15 and then 15 and then 24. And each time you hit that point, it would be at 300 points. Each time you fired, it would cycle to 50, 75, whatever. So the way you guaranteed to get a 300 points spacecraft was you hid underneath your buildings and you blasted away until your count went up so you could go bang, 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 bang. But you blow your buildings to bits. So what's missing from this picture is the damage underneath the building. Yeah? And then you'd get your, your count up to 50 and you fire and you get a 300 point spacecraft. So that's what's missing. So you all suck. <laughs> Can't believe no one got that. Okay, so it's a 20 year old game and you know. Play it on MAME, it's cool. You, nah, well again, you, can't, you start to run out of bad guys. The bad guys end up too high up. So you shoot the underside of the building because that's the only thing left. You weren't looking for details. <laughs> now you all suck. <laughs> yeah, I guess you were the closest. Black or purple? Okay, so what we're going to look at today is um, swipe cards. So here's some examples, um, the usual thing. Got some top-up cards. These are very popular in the UK um, because you can walk into any supermarket and just take them off the shelf. Uh, hotel key card, obviously, and, and a cash card. So, again, at this other conference, um, we had to to get around the building you had to have your key card with you the whole time so going up and down in the elevator it was a reasonably crowded conference you know there are a few hundred people there and every time I got in the elevator I was using my key card same as everyone else only mine looked different from theirs it was one of these keys and what I was doing was trying to see if anyone actually noticed that I was using the wrong key so I, I put up this slide and I asked the room okay I've, I've traveled up and down in this elevator with you guys dozens of times in the last two to three days. How many people actually spotted what was the, the, the key card I was using? No one in, well, one guy in the room actually spotted it. And the, um, the sort of lesson from that was, and it, it was this one, by the way. So that was my room key. It's a Tesco's mobile phone top-up card, which I had cloned my room key onto. But the, the object of the exercise was to be able to use the key so naturally that nobody notices you doing it. So when you're a secret agent like me, you know, James Bond, you have to be able to do that stuff. So you practice that. If you're going to, you know, to be good at social engineering or to be good at doing something, you have to practice it, practice it, practice it until it just comes so naturally that you don't even think about it. And in fact, I got into a situation, I was going up in the elevator and the elevator's you know, we're whizzing up to the 17th floor, and about the ninth floor, the elevator suddenly stopped, turns around and starts going back down again. 
Now, when you're James Bond, that's usually not a good sign. <laughs> and I was thinking, holy crap, what's going to happen? I'm going to be down in the basement and the ninjas will be coming in. And <laughs> so anyway, the door opens and sure enough, a member of staff walks in. And so I made some lame joke about her having an override and she's like, oh, are you having trouble with your key? I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> so I thought, well, what can I do? I've, I've only got my bright yellow key with me and she works in this hotel. So I just went, uh, well, don't think so. Put my normal key in, put the yellow key in. The, the, the lift mechanism made the nice beep noise, selected the floor and off we went. Didn't bat an eyelid. So, you know, if you can fool the staff who are looking out specifically for a problem with the key, you pull out the bright, shiny yellow key and you wham it in the thing, <laughs> and she doesn't pay any attention, then, yeah, it's all about attitude and the way you do it. If you don't feel suspicious and don't look suspicious, you'll get away with it. So, so similarly... Now, in this case, I knew damn well no one could spot it because I'd done the whole thing. You know, I left the building by the back exit, went under the ground, got in a car, changed car twice, went in the underground. But, of course, it was that one. Okay, so the, the kit that I used to do this stuff, um, there's the sort of off-the-shelf stuff. Uh, there's a very nice piece of kit called a Max Stripe. Um, I've got one here. Uh, mine is slightly modified, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> it's a parallel port device. It can read and write all three tracks. Um, it will give you access to the raw data, so it's not trying to actually interpret the data as it goes along. So you can read cards that have been deliberately scrambled or have got bad parity or wrong checksums or whatever. Um, unfortunately, it only runs under Windows, so um, I put on my rubber gloves and installed some on here. <laughs> Doesn't work with VMware. Yeah, well, full body condom, actually. But, you know. <laughs> the other thing you can do is build your own. Um, and again, we'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. There's a, a very good site, um, the link's there, where you can download a, a detailed article about how to do this. The nice thing about this device is, um, again, it just reads raw data. The downside is it's read-only. Um, again, we'll talk about that more later. So this is the, the software that comes with the Mac Stripe. Um, these, these screenshots are just stolen from their website, so I don't take any credit for them. So basically, you have a, a, a program running that's just scanning for, for data. You swipe the card and it will then give you the, the raw ASCII. You can switch into binary mode, do signal analysis, and so on. So if I want to look at the binary that I've read. It has some stuff for trying to interpret the data. So you can say, OK, I want to look at it as if it was a 6-bit number, or a 7-bit number, or a 5-bit number. And it will give you rolling CRCs and so on, check the parity for you. And it has the ability to write, so I can write all three tracks. So this is basically what I normally use to clone things. Just read it, write it back. Very easy. And it's cheap. So the kind of tracks that we're looking at, um, there, there are three main standards. I mean, obviously, a lot of people do proprietary stuff as well, but the three main standards you'll, you'll encounter is track one is IATA data, um, track two, ABA, and track three, thrift. We're going to look at track one in, in detail today. And if you're going to play with this stuff and you want to actually get your hands dirty and start looking at the data, um, there's some good documentation on the MagTech site. This will give you the, um, the, the bit tables to convert um, from binary to, to ASCII. OK, so the first thing I looked at was my um, boarding pass. So it's basically track one, it's 210 bits per inch, 7-bit character set, 
79 alphanumeric characters. And the data that's on there is you get a, a start sentinel followed by a character that says what format the rest of the track's in and some details like which airport you're coming from, which flight you're on, what day of the year you're going on and so on. So this is the data that was actually stored on my um, boarding pass. So we're going from uh, Vancouver to London Heathrow. That's my seat, 19K, so in the cheap seats. Um, and my name? Try my? Yeah, I, sh I should have a play with the, uh, the loyalty card maybe next time. Okay, so I, I thought, well, on the, the, the new systems, in the old days, you used to just hand your um, boarding pass to the nice stewardess and she would say, welcome on board, type your seat number in and send you on your way. But now you hand them your boarding pass and they stick it in a machine and the machine reads the Meg Stripe. So I thought, well, why don't I just modify it? <laughs> what could be simpler than upgrading myself? <laughs> but then I thought, well, that's not going to work because the back-end system will disagree with what's on my mag stripe. So I thought, okay, well, how about having the back-end system modify it for me? So this is before and this is after. So if you could read that. <laughs> For those at the back that can't read it, it says, um, or one equals one. Update flight, set seat, equals one A, where passenger equals lorry Adam Mister. <laughs> So now I figure instead of them saying, oh, yeah, welcome to the right, they'll say, oh, Mr. Laurie, you seem to have been upgraded. Let me carry that bag for you. <laughs> Would you like a happy finish with your free cha champagne? So. <laughs> That's my fantasy, come on. Okay, so the other system um, I had a good look at was the, the hotels. Um, not this one, I hasten to add, if there's any brown shirts in the room. Mm. And there's a couple of different kinds of, of locks that are out there. You've got um, what they call passive locks. This is kind of upside down. Um, passive locks, all the logic's in the lock. So actually it's actively doing all the checking for you. And you've got the active locks where all the logic is on a remote back end. So it's kind of passively reading data for you, which is kind of odd. Um, but basically, those are the two kinds. 80% of all the locks in the hotels in the world are of the passive kind, apparently. So the way a passive lock works is when you um, stick your key in the lock, it does a quick check. It looks at the key, says, is this the right kind of key? If it is, it then does another check. Is it a special key? And if it's a special key, it will then perform a special action. And the action depends on what type of key it is. So it might be housekeeping getting in. It might be a one-time pass. They can actually issue keys that will let you into the room once and once only. Um, it might be a cancellation key to, to stop the key being usable, stop the room being usable. And um, the most interesting one is a crime scene lockout key. So basically, this is the DOS this lock key. You stick that in the lock and it doesn't work anymore. It says, bye bye. I'm not playing anymore. Dr drill me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've been careful not to make any of those. I'll show you how to be careful not to make those in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next check is, um, is it the correct room? If it is, is it a rescinded key? If it is, then reject it. If it's not a rescinded key, is it an expired key? 
Um, no, is it a new key? If it's a new key, it will rescind the previous key, and if it's um, not a new key, in other words, it's the current key, it'll open the door. Um, it, in both cases, you, you get to open the door. So, basically, what's happening is your key is acting as the device that reprograms the lock to say the last guest has now left and I am the new guest. Okay? So once you've been through these, these tests, this last step actually is deciding whether or not this is the same guy returning to his room or this is a new guest taking over the room. So they, can, they use the guest to go and reprogram the lock of the door after the last guy moved out. So um, here's a, a key set that we looked at. And basically what you've got is I've put question marks on some of the fields because I'm not 100% sure but that's what it is. That's my best guess. So you've got your start sentinel. You've got a number, which I'm guessing is the property number. You've got the room number, which definitely matched my room. You've got the key number, which um, definitely matched my key number because I would go back to reception and say, you know, I've lost my key. Um, can you give me another one? <laughs> and you could see that if you went and got a duplicate key, the only field that changed was the key number and the redundancy check digit on the end. So armed with that information, I produced a completely new key. And again, I just changed one character, calculated the, the correct redundancy character, programmed the key, bingo, door opened. No big deal because you know, all I've done is really cloned the key. I could have, uh, I had to have that information anyway. So I wondered what's the difference between a new key for a new guest and my existing key. So I go down to reception and say, look, you know, I've lost my key, only this time I don't want a duplicate because I think, you know, that the agents that are after me have probably stolen it. <laughs> It's really important that the high-tech secret gear in my room doesn't get stolen, so I need a key that cancels my old key. So whoever found it is not going to get in. And so they give me a new key. And in this case, the only difference, it's gone back to key number one, the only difference is this, which I'm assuming is a magic number, that says this is a new key. All the other details are the same, expiry date, room number, key number, and so on. Now this particular manufacturer claim on their website that these locks are impregnable because they have a gazillion bit number that's impossible to guess. So actually, you know, how many digits, how many bits are different between a 4 and a 32? I think it's less than a gazillion. Um, and no, I'm not going to tell you the magic formula for generating the magic number. But the way the, the rescinding process works is basically the new magic number goes into the lock. So when it sees a key, if it's the same magic number as last time, then it will let you in, assuming all the other checks succeed. If it's a new magic number, then that just becomes the current key. So it's a very, very simple system. And the, the, the lock will store the last hundred seen keys. So, basically this is just a pseudo-random sequence of numbers and it has to be different from the last hundred numbers that were issued and that seems to be it. So, um, if you happen to be in one of those hotels, let me know how you get on. Uh, I'm not going to say what the lock manufacturer is here. I've contacted them and so far they, they can't get their head out of the sand. So. Okay, on the other hand, um, you've got active locks. Active locks make the decision remotely, so you swipe the key and there's a back-end system that decides whether or not you should be staying in there. They, they seem to be one-wire interfaces. Um, checking is done, as I say, against a live database. They also can use the key swipe on those systems to send messages. So similarly with the infrared controls in the, the room, they can actually, where you know, the maid could say, right, the room's clean, or the, the guy filling the minibar could say, I've put, well, amazingly, no more booze in Mr. Laurie's room again. So. <laughs> um, 
you can send messages by swiping a special card. I haven't looked at the details of what you can send, but I'm sure there's some interesting stuff that one could do there. Unfortunately, it also seems to connect to their security system. So, as we found out. Um, <laughs> so we were, you know, playing away, go to the door, swipe, go back in the room, now that didn't work, try something else. Go back out, swipe, yeah, that didn't work, try something else. Go back out, oh, hello Mr. Security Guard. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. I seem to be having trouble with my key, I better go down to reception and change it. So, uh, yeah, they do watch the active systems. So, um, at least that's, that's good. You know, someone's paying attention, raises an alarm, and someone comes and investigates. Um, they're, they're less common. I guess in newer hotels they'll become more common. They'll, they'll be fitted, but retrofitting is, is much harder because it's not just a standalone box with a bunch of batteries in it. So. How does the system fail if you can't talk to the database? Um, I would guess that it, it, it's not going to fail to open. It's going to fail to, you know, this lock is not going to do anything because I can't talk to the database. It's possible they have the passive circuitry built in as well. So the lock is capable of, of making the decision for itself. Um, if there's a fire, I don't need to get into a room. I need my spy gear back, that's true. I mean, I need to get into the room. You guys don't need to get into the room, but, yeah. Fire department room checks. Or when they're going and, and... Yeah, I mean, I assume they have a system. They, the master key will work. Again, I would... I'm sorry, they have an axe, yeah. And big, big rubber boots. Um, I would guess, I mean, if I, if I was designing such a system, I would make the locks work as a passive device as well and just use the back end as a, as a double check. So. Are they wired or wireless? Um, are they wired or wireless? The ones I've seen so far appear to be wired. Um, basically, the, the, in this particular hotel, some floors were passive and some were active, and the difference physically was there was an extra LED on, on the active ones, and it would pulse every now and then to show it had a, a connection to the back end. Um, we didn't go as far as actually breaking the wire to see what happened, but uh, I suppose one could accidentally st <laughs> stick a knife through the wall or something. <laughs> uh, were they bound to the door or the door jam? They were bound to the. Uh, they, they were on the outside of the door frame, so they were in the the wall where they've got somewhere to root the the stuff back. But, uh, Okay, so those are kind of standard um, mag stripes. I also became quite interested in non-standard stripes um, and the technologies to, to be able to read those. So you'll see on these you've got things like um, a stripe in the middle of the card instead of where it should normally be. So th this is front and back, by the way. So. And you can use... Uh, Again, if you saw my previous stuff, I'm a great fan of sort of visualization of things. I like to be able to understand what's going on by visualizing it and, and getting a, a feel for you know, what I'm dealing with. And uh, again, this is a, a mark of just how old school I am. When the old days of dealing with half-inch mag tape, we needed this stuff. So we, we had this fluid called Magnacy, and it's basically for visualizing magnetic fields. I had some lying around my office, and it's, they use it for lining up um, heads on, on mag magnetic recording equipment and getting the lead in and so on. Um, it's actually made of carbon tetrachloride, which uh, is now banned as a carcinogen, so um, don't use it, it'll kill you. It's fine for me, I'm James Bond, licensed to kill myself, so... but. Actually, um, I've been looking for a replacement, and I did find some. I haven't used this stuff, but it is on the market again. Um, these guys, QCard, have some stuff called QView, which allegedly does the same thing. I haven't tried it. If anyone has, anyone here tried it? Anyone here know what the hell I'm talking about? <laughs> no, okay. 3M make a disc called MagnaView. 
No. Okay, nice. Right, so yeah, apparently 3M do one where the fluid is actually between two bits of polyethylene, so you presumably you just lay it on top of the thing and you can visualize without ever getting all sticky and disgusting. So this is how you apply um, Magnacy. You just drip some on. Um, and those of you that saw my previous talk will probably expect that's the kind of stain you would expect to see in my room. But, uh, <laughs> but actually it's, um, it's very useful. So as it dries out, you get to see the, the stripe itself. So this is the iron filings lining up on the, on the mag fields. It's still not that visible, so I do the old fingerprint thing. Stick some tape across it. Peel it off and then stick it on a piece of paper and now you can really see what's going on. So it looks just like a barcode. Does it destroy the card? No, it's completely harmless. Um, you just wipe it off when you're done. Um, it doesn't even seem to make too much of a mess of the signature strip either if you if you get some on the signature strip and <laughs> some some of the ink comes off or something like that yeah. so you can see it's immediately obvious when you're looking at a card that has two stripes rather than one so instead of just randomly doing stuff on a reader and, and wondering why you're getting no result you can actually look at it and see what the hell's going on on the card. So clearly, I mean, my photography is crap still, hasn't improved since last time. Um, but you can see this track is much higher density than this track. So we're already getting useful information back, a difference in, in between the two tracks. So the other thing that you can see is just how big the mag stripe is. I mean, these two stripes look the same. But the actual track is laid down, is completely different. So you get, again, you get an understanding of why you're simple cloning. You know, I, I went to some trouble to make my head be in the middle of the thing, but if I tried to clone a British Rail ticket, it wouldn't work. And once I visualized it, I could see immediately why. I'm writing this skimpy little track here, and they're expecting this big fat one here. So really useful information. And that's presumably uh, deliberately done that way to stop me from cloning the cards. And actually it turns out that although the track was wider, the, the bits per inch were exactly the same. And again, you can, you can see that purely from the visualization. You can look at the, the vertical bars and you can count it and measure it. And the, the track that I really wasn't getting any data off turns out not to have any on it. So. I could have wasted even more than the three hours in that hotel room that night. Okay, so um, tools for actually decoding the data. Once you read the mag stripe down to, to the PC, some of the homemade devices, basically you, 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 because you're piping it through your sound card, you end up with a WAV file. So there's some software out there will, that will take the uh, mag stripe and turn it into um, binary. And what you get is a, a string of ones and zeros. And I've written a little program called BinChop, which basically you just say to it, chop this up in seven bits and tell me if the parity works, or chop it up in six bits, tell me if the parity works. And you can grab that from, from the website. I'm not going to bother to demonstrate it here because we're going to do some much more interesting stuff in a second. I also, to really properly understand what was going on, I decided to rewrite um, that code in, in Python. I've, I've become a huge fan of Python because I haven't programmed for years and it's just such a really nice language to, to relearn to program in. So, anyone else here Python fans? Yeah? Python rules. Or sucks, depending on your point of view. I like it. Um, so basically I rewrote it and by rewriting it I really properly understood how, how the system works. And um, I also then wrote the, the code the other way around so I can generate the, the binary files from the, um, or oh, sorry, the Aiken biphase from the, the binary. Now, 
in all the films, you know, James Bond goes into a lab and there's like Q with his guys in white coats and shiny equipment and stuff. Well, yeah, in reality that doesn't happen. This is what your lab looks like. It's the wife's dining room table and all your crap spread out on it. And this is where we get our equipment from. <laughs> Some old builder's rubbish pile. So basically I, I decided to build my own reader. Um, found this old cassette deck on, on a pile of crap. And really all you need out of it is the, the mag stripe head. So just you know, tear them out. You don't need the rest of it. And what I've got somewhere here, oh, there it is. So little homemade reader going into um, the sound card input on the PC. So you do a read and you get something that sort of looks like that, a standard WAV file. And when you look at the actual data, what they're doing at the low level is um, a thing called F2F, which is a form of um, frequency shift keying. So rather than actually changing uh, a real frequency, they're changing the, the frequency of an event happening. So F2F is frequency twice frequency, which basically means that um, a one is exactly twice as often as a, a zero. It's used in a lot of protocols, so it's worth understanding um, you know, infrared, RFID, and so on. RF remote. Did you just flash me a 10 minute warning? Yeah. Okay, we finish at 10 too. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll try and speed up. Um, I thought we got the full hour, never mind. Um, and it's, it's used because it's self clocking, it's very, very robust. Um, the the um, signal will re clock as it goes along, so it's good in noisy environments or inaccurate environments like a swipe where you may be speeding up and slowing down. So, this is the way it works the mag stripe travels over the reed head, you get north, north flux transitions or south, south flux transitions, so you'll get a little pulse every time that happens, and that turns into um, that shape waveform. So, if we look at an actual mag stripe read, here we've got the pulses as we read the mag stripe, which translates to, you know, a single pulse is a zero, two pulses is a one, single pulse zero. So this is the same period, time period here. So very, very simple to decode. So generating them should be pretty simple. So at first I generated a, a basic sawtooth. So a single pulse for zero, two pulses for one. Actually, when I came to play it back, I could not get a sensible result at all. So I figured in the end it was my sound card wasn't high enough quality, so I upgraded to a, a USB, a, a slightly better sound card. So if you play with this stuff and you find you're just not getting meaningful results, try going through a higher spec sound card. So I finally, once I did that, I started to get a result. But what happened is I encoded 000101 and what I got out was 60110011, which was kind of weird. Actually, it turned out that what was happening is on my optimized um, WAV file, it was seeing both sides of the transition as a pulse. So I just modified the code to say, okay, well, I don't care if it's plus or minus down the center line, and bingo, it started working. So. Now, a quick bit of video. I forgot to plug in the output. Has, have we got um, sound up here? No, no, your input. I need an input to go into there. Now, after all my hardware problems, I'm hoping this is going to work. Please insert your stolen card now. <laughs> Pin number. 
Will you hurry up? This is taking too long. Go, baby, go, baby, go, baby. All right. Pin number nine zero Who'd you learn this stuff from, anyway? From my mom. My real mom, I mean. Um, withdraw three zero zero bucks. Come on, baby. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes. Hey, it worked. All right. Easy money. Come on. So how many of us saw that and thought, hmm, I wonder if that's possible. Well, I did. So, When I talk to people about this, everyone seems to jump to the same conclusion and probably half the room is going, oh yeah, I wonder about those things you put in your car and you plug it into your, hi -fi, your, your MP3 player or whatever. Um, if that can fool a reader into getting a signal, why can't I do the same with a mag stripe? After all, inside it's just a mag head, yeah? So I took a mag stripe card and I had a friend with a machine shop who machined out the mag stripe for me, cut a couple of channels, got an old phone ringer and some copper wire, a bit of old saw blade, and hey presto, we've got a card with a great big magnetic head in it where the mag stripe should be. Now, I'm actually not able to demonstrate the final product. This is going to be a, an ongoing thing. But what I did to, to actually see if this could possibly work was um, wired directly into my reader. So I've got a standard reader here, which will read a normal mag stripe. And I've wired sound, a sound input into the head. So I'm going to see if I can fool the reader into thinking it's seen. Um, a card by sending it a wave file. Okay. So this is probably going to seem like a stupid question, but um, has anyone got a credit card in the room? <laughs> is anyone brave enough? I mean, I'll do it with my own, but it, it's kind of better if, if it's a real one. They can be expired, come on. You got one. Thank you. Okay, so I'm really hoping this is going to work. I had so many problems the last couple of days. Okay. So first thing we do is grab a little sound bite. How cool is that? <laughs> OK, so I'm going to decode Aiken binary temp test.wav. Ah, crap. That doesn't look good. Try again. get another job as a musician. <laughs> okay. That one looks reasonably good. Okay, that looks quite hopeful. Yes. So basically, I've taken his binary, and uh, your name is Picard? El Capitan? <laughs> so.
So just to show I'm not faking it, um, this is a normal reader. It's the mag stripe, the max stripe. So I've just read it on the max stripe. So now we're going to see if we can fool the max stripe into seeing um, a different version of that. So what I do is take his data and say You need to give it a bunch of leading or tra leading zeros to get the clock to sync. Okay, so spit out a bunch of binary. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I screwed up anyway because I hadn't sent the different data. So, so what I'm going to do is change his name. So here we have some binary, and I now say spit out a WAV file, and sample rate of 25. So I've now got a file on my um, temp directory. Go back to Mr. Reader and say, So when I swipe this card and they ID me, it's going to have my name, but your credit card details. <laughs> my wife thanks you for the shopping trip. We'll soon be there. Uh... <laughs> you don't know how happy I am that that worked. Okay, I've got to wind up. I'm being kicked off the stage. Before I go, um, I just wanted to give props to um, Joe Grand for his wonderful badge. And there is a challenge, of course, that you need to modify these things. So I've added... Um, I've added a daughter board to mine. <laughs> and again, from the visualisation point of view, when you're testing this, an IR emitter is not visible to the human eye, but it is to a camera. So um, I can now run TV Be Gone. <laughs> or as I call it, TV Be Goon. <laughs> so come and see me if you want yours modded. Thank you.